Welcome to Practice Best Practices, Art of Numbers, Bookkeeping for Creatives workshop. I'm Dan Santoro of SNG Project Gallery, and I'll be hosting the workshop tonight. We'd like to start off by thanking our generous funders, Rockland Trust Charitable Foundation, the New Bedford, Fall River, Dartmouth, and Fairhaven Local Cultural Councils, uh, local agencies who are supported by the Mass Cultural Council, a state agency, Mass Development and TDI, uh, the Bar Foundation, and New Bedford Creative. We're also supported by generous in-kind support from our partners, the National Park Service, New Bedford Art Museum Artworks, New Bedford Co-Creative Center, New Bedford Creative, and SNG Project Gallery Art Brokerage. <clears throat> we also want to thank Lisa Aldrich, Hollis Mahala, Lisa Rach, and Dolly Town for taking time from their busy lives to create the workshop content uh, and take time to answer your questions tonight. Uh, this is our fourth workshop. We've moved online because of coronavirus, so please bear with us if we have any uh, technical issues. A few notes before we begin. Um, if you have a question during the workshop, please type them into the chat. Margo Sonia of New Bedford Creative and I will be monitoring them. When we select your question, we will ask you to unmute so you can ask your question out loud. This will also give you ability to follow up on questions if needed. Um, if you prefer for us to read them rather than uh, go on screen, tell us when you type your question in. Um, we suggest you put your Zoom in speaker mode rather than gallery mode. <clears throat> we'll have a short online survey, which you can take right um, here in the meeting, um, which we'll put up near the end of the session. Feedback is really important to us, so please fill it out. Um, we'll, <clears throat> you can also add comments about the workshop in the chat as we're wrapping up, or you can email them to contact at practicebestpractice.com. We have resource documents on the workshop page of the website for you to download if you want. <clears throat> They're at practicebestpractice.com. Uh, we'll also be recording this workshop on, and put it in online within a few days for those of you who missed it or wish to review. Um, we hope that you've also liked us on Facebook and Instagram and signed up for our mailing list. Um, <clears throat> and although our workshops are always free, they do cost to produce. Um, if you would like to make a tax deductible contribution to practice best practice, you can find a donate button at the top of our website on every page. Um, now, without further ado, let me introduce our presenters to tonight. Lisa Aldrich, president of Lisa Aldrich CPA PC. Lisa provides personalized, thoughtful accounting and tax services tailored to unique small business needs. Hollis Mahala, RIWS. Besides being an artist who uses a bookkeeper, Hollis is a watercolor painter, alchemist, and puzzle designer based in Rehoboth. Lisa Rach, CPA, MST, is founder of Bodhi Business Advisors, a business advisory and consulting firm supporting entrepreneurs in a variety of ways. And Dolly Town is the owner of Bookkeeping Town, LLC. Dolly has been in the industry for 15 years. We suggest you read their full bios on our website for more info and how to contact them. Now, without further ado, let me turn things over to Hollis. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, hope you're having a great evening. I'm going to jump right in and share my screen and start the presentation here. Um, just bear with me for just one second here. All right, I hope everybody can see this. Um, again, my name is Hollis Mahal. I'm just gonna do a quick intro as to what kind of artist I am. Um, I am a signature member of the Rhode Island Watercolor Society. Uh, my studio's name is Mahala Arts Watercolor Studio. And um, through my education and trials in interior design, graphic design, and multimedia, I began to focus on specifically using watercolor art to help intentionally curate the spaces where we live our lives to reflect what we love and value most in this world. I am drawn to uh, and renewed by nature, photography, and food for my painting inspirations. You can find me eating avocados, hiking, and photographing um, and tree bathing as often as I can all while living in with my family and painting in my home uh, in Rehoboth. So, with that said, uh, I am a painter, so um, I know we probably have an all kinds of artists here tonight. Um, would love to know what kinds of artists are here tonight. So if you'd like to put that in the chat, um, uh, we'd love to know. Um, but uh, I'm sure there are many of you here who might be painters, um, but there's also photographer, photographers, musicians, and pottery makers, and all kinds of artists. So I hope this can help you to 
start to think about your process in, in relation to bookkeeping, because it, uh, I think it's one of the most important things to start off with if you are just starting with book with a bookkeeper. Um, and so to move on, I just want to tell you a little bit about the journey of, of the artist to bookkeeping. Uh, and some of my, some of my personal journey as well kind of started when I started being a little bit more successful in the arts that I was doing. And I started getting this weight on top of my shoulders where, um, you know, I had a, a CPA who was doing my personal taxes um, and they were helping me transition, but I, um, I didn't have a lot of time to do the books myself. Uh, I couldn't do it all. And um, I would rather be creating, right? Um, I don't know any artists who'd rather, uh, who'd, who'd rather be doing bookkeeping. So um, <laughs> uh, I um, started to want to need a bookkeeper in um, my studio. So um, you can start to drown in your materials and your bookkeeping knowledge if you are just starting, um, it may not, it might behoove you to have a bookkeeper. And if you want to grow, definitely, definitely need a bookkeeper um, to start. So a bookkeeper can lift the weight off your shoulders and help you keep creating, right? So um, that's one of the important things that we want to do as artists. And they can, what a bookkeeper can do is help you categorize and navigate the software to prepare for tax season and plan for your future creative goals. They can give you reports so you can understand your spending habits and they can give you more time to do what, you're, what you love, which is creating, right? So, um, so some of the tools and tips um, that I just wanna point out tonight um, that have helped me are if you are just starting with um, doing bookkeeping um, yourself, perhaps start with an Excel or a Google doc to help you break out your revenue and expenses so that you and your bookkeeper and CPA can be more informed um, informed as to the cash flows and process of your creative business. I have a template here that I'm gonna share with you in a few minutes about for what I started with in uh, my business that I think can help you. Um, and then I do wanna recommend that you schedule time each month to categorize and balance your statements uh, and pay any taxes that you need to pay, uh, it will be easier for you to do it in a monthly chunk rather than wait until March or April when your taxes are due. Um, and then just knowing the difference between a bookkeeper and a certified public accountant or a CPA, why would you need both? So the difference between a, a CPA and a bookkeeper is that, uh, as far as I know, and some of these ladies might be able to tell you their specific differences, but the bookkeepers and account, um, the CPAs and bookkeepers are both accounting professionals, but they, um, but CPA's role is really to provide financial advice and a bookkeeper is mainly responsible for maintaining and organizing the record of all those financial transactions. So um, if you need more clarification, I'm sure these ladies can tell you um, and then um, bringing on a bookkeeper can help you uh, spend more time in your studio and less time in, with the money, as I mentioned before. And if you have any tax questions, I always suggest asking your CPA. So, you know, as, as right brain people, we, uh, we're not always the greatest with bookkeeping. And um, I'm going to share my Excel here and hopefully this can help you. I hope that you can see this now. And if you can, please let me know. Um, it is a chart of, so there's two tabs on this Excel sheet, which I believe is gonna be provided at the end of this presentation. Um, but um, I have a goals tab down here that I used when I first started and it's really to project a year's worth of revenue and expenses. So I have uh, a revenue section up here and an expenses section down here. And then what you can do is start playing. This is kind of a projection tool for 
for you as an artist and you can start changing the numbers and um, input them for your business, you know, for any online shows you have or galleries or classes or however you use um, your, however you create what you create um, to make revenue. Um, you know, you can put that in, in this chart and start projecting a little bit. And then if you want to get a little bit more specific before you talk to a bookkeeper, this expense and sales breakout tab down here. And this is really to get really super specific on your business. Um, and it, um, I have some sample dates here and some, um, you know, you might have a bank statement or a credit card that you use a lot. You know, you can feel free to categorize this as you use your own um, finances or, or have different accounts here. What I do is I break them out per line item and um, and then there, every column after this kind of breaks out supplies and personal development and other things that you might do is like marketing or um, over here we have you know show show and entry fees and um, office supplies those things all go into bookkeeping and a bookkeeper can really help you to categorize these in the softwares that they, that they use. I currently use QuickBooks. Um, I'm one of those people that just kind of wanted to dive into the QuickBooks. And um, I think some of these ladies are gonna tell you uh, some of the other softwares that are out there that can help you. But, um, you know, this is color coded. So it's a, it's a pretty big document. Um, so the green is income and the orange is expenses. And then the blue is owner equity is what's been, what you might want to put into the business. Um, so I hope this uh, chart can maybe help you get started with uh, talking to a bookkeeper and um, start writing everything down so that they're not completely confused when you start talking to one. So um that is pretty much what I have. I'm gonna see if I can open the chat just for a second. And um, I see we have some painters here tonight and pottery, ooh, we have pottery. So um, if you have any specific questions, I guess you can put them in the chat and um, let us know as we go, but I'm gonna introduce Dolly Town who's gonna take it over from here. And I appreciate you all listening. Thank you so much, Hollis. Oh, yes, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much, Hollis. That was an awesome presentation. Um, so I just wanna apologize, I, I'm not live because my internet is very um, slow. So I just didn't wanna use up the, the video. Um, so. Um, my name is, um, is Dolly Town, and I am the owner of Bookkeeping Town. And um, uh, just to give you a little, little bit of um, background on myself, um, I work with many small businesses, guiding them on their way to regain control, attain financial security, and get their time back. The majority of my clients are in the food industry and are artists also. Um, but I also help other businesses in other industries. Uh, some of the services that I do offer are monthly, quarterly uh, bookkeeping, sales tax management, accounts receivable, accounts payable management, uh, payroll services, uh, financial statement review, and advisory services. Um, uh, so in the new year, I am working on a personal finance program. Um, but for now, I am going to um, share my screen. Uh, let me see. All right. All right. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about today are um, accounting softwares. Um, and the chart of accounts. So these two pieces um, make the, the basis of your bookkeeping. Um, you know, so first you do want to um, 
to, to know what type of accounting software that would work for you. Um, so a few examples are um, QuickBooks Online, FreshBooks, Xero, um, Account Edge Pro, and Zoho Books. Um, so I'm just gonna go into a little bit of detail on each one. Um, so QuickBooks Online um, might be the most recognized of all of the small business accounting applications. Um, so designed, they are designed exclusively for small businesses um, and they offer easy anytime, anywhere access that was lacking in their most um, robust desktop version. Um, a good fit for small and growing businesses um, would be QuickBooks Online. Um, it is often compared to FreshBooks, um, it integrates with hundreds of third-party applications, uh, making the application suitable for all types of businesses. Um, and then FreshBooks is an online accounting software application that works well for sole proprietors and freelancers. Uh, the retainers feature in FreshBooks also makes it ideal for attorneys, accountants, and any professional that charges their clients a retainer fee. Um, Zero is an online accounting software that offers the, the convenience of running your business from anywhere. It's designed for um, small business owners who doesn't want to spend a lot of time learning accounting, but wants to stay on top of business performance. Uh, Zero works great for a variety of niche markets, including retail, IT, legal, e-commerce, and startups. Um, Account Edge Pro is a a good fit for small and growing businesses. Um, it's an on-premise application that also offers the convenience of remote access easily through the entire accounting cycle. And then lastly, Zoho Books. Um, so if you're a sole proprietor, a freelancer, or starting a brand new business, um, Zoho Books would work. Um, it's affordable for even the tightest budget. Zoho Books includes a solid inventory management feature and provides new users with step-by-step -step directions for everything from general setup to writing an invoice, uh, making it easy to get your business um, set up and running quickly. Um, these resources, um, I did use um, fool.com to get um, uh, the, the top five. All right. And then the next thing I feel that um, the chart of accounts is the business uh, base of any business. Um, so it lists all the general ledger accounts that a business uses to organize its financial transactions systematically. Every account in the chart of accounts holds a number to facilitate its identification in the ledger while reading the financial statements. So I'm just gonna go through um, each uh, type of account with you. Um, and then if you have any questions on anything, I, you know, from my presentation, you can just put that in the chat. Um, so an asset is a property owned by a person or company that has value. Examples would be cash, bank accounts, buildings, vehicles, machinery, or equipment. Um, all the asset accounts um, contain account numbers starting with one. Um, that's if you're going to use the numbering system um, in your chart of accounts. A liability <clears throat> is a financial obligation owed to a company or person. And those examples are credit cards, payroll, any type of loans or bills. All the liability accounts contain the account numbers starting with two. An equity account can represent the book value of a company and can assess the financial health of a company. Uh, this is the reason why a bank would need a copy of your balance sheet. Um, all the owner's equity entries um, contain the account number starting with number three. Um, and assets, liabilities, and equity are related to your balance sheet. Now we jump to the revenue. Um, that is money generated from normal business operations um, examples are sales revenue, interest received, um, income from scrap, or any other earnings. Um, all the revenue accounts uh, contain account numbers starting with four. And then lastly, um, an expense is the cost of operations that a company incurs to generate revenue. Um, examples are cost of goods sold, rent, 
rent, electricity, salary, and wages, and any other business expense. All the expense accounts contain numbers starting with five. Um, expenses and revenues are related to the income statements. Um, and what I do for um, my clients, I do have a QuickBooks setup program. So this just helps you um, decide because QuickBook, I am a QuickBooks online pro advisor. So um, I am biased to QuickBooks online. Um, and if you decide on QuickBooks Online, I can definitely help you. Um, so I would like set up the chart of accounts, um, help you decide what subscription that works for you and um, connect your bank accounts. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions um, here, I'm just gonna leave this up just for a few seconds. Um, you know, you can definitely contact me um, or just send me um, a, a private message as well. All right, thank you. And I give you Lisa Aldrich. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. <laughs> so I have a little handout as well. And let's see if I can do that. Yep, there we go. Okay, so, um, so I'm a CPA. I do uh, a lot of what Dolly does, but um, I also do tax and kind of uh, kind of bring everything from the from the beginning the check the, you know the checkbook accounting <laughs> all the way through to tax returns financial statements I do nonprofit work I do all sorts of good stuff um, let's see so uh, my focus today is financial reporting for your creative business and actually I'm going to do that so it's a little cleaner um, and so the things I wanted to talk to you to about today are are you profitable so how would you know, right? Um, I, I get that question a lot from, from clients. And my usual question is, if you don't have a lot of debt, if you just really have your cash account and maybe a few pieces of equipment, and you really just are making your um, making whatever creative you have and, um, and selling that, uh, basically, how does your bank account feel? <laughs> do you do you feel it's like it's pretty good? It's pretty it's pretty heavy, and you can take out money every month. That's a great example of a profitable business, most likely. Um, so think about your cash balance, and that's a really just it's, it's a great indicator of of profitability. Uh, to to echo Dolly, you want to reconcile? Uh, no, to echo ha, ha, to to echo Hollis as well. Reconcile your cash every month. Um, it's just make sure that you have everything in the right spot. You make sure you, you don't have anything that went through your cash account that you weren't expecting, some membership that you thought you canceled or something like that. Uh, it just really helps you stay on track. Um, and the other big thing I tell people a lot is to keep your business income and your expenses in a business account. And same with credit cards. Keep it in a business account. Don't try to marry in your personal with your business type um, pieces. And um, <laughs> I think Dolly would appreciate that if you didn't have your personal stuff with your business. <laughs> it makes it hard to pull apart uh, the activity that goes in there. Um, the next thing would be to update your accounting records. You can keep it pretty basic. You don't have to have 20,000 different kinds of expenses. If you are, for example, if you're a painter, um, I saw in Hollis's, um, Spreadsheet, she had materials, nice and simple. She had canvases, you know, you might put brushes under there, you might put the basic materials under there. You might have supplies if you wanna keep maybe your brushes as a separate thing from what you're creating. But at the end of the day, just keep it basic, keep it meaningful, put in the accounts that make sense to you. And um, don't don't you don't need to create a lot of different expenses. Um, my guideline is, especially if you're starting out, don't spend more than an hour each. I don't think it would take you more than an hour each month. And it certainly, um, if you farm it out to a <laughs> bookkeeper, <laughs> then, um, and it's pretty simple. I, I imagine they could get it done pretty quickly as well. So, uh, you know, if you just commit to that hour each month of getting your records updated, I think you'll be a lot happier. You'll know where you are. Um, in terms of income and expenses, you can have those conversations with your CPA about paying about paying in taxes if you need to. If your cash account is feeling heavy, you probably need to um, think about paying in estimates. And um, it, it's just a good idea to know where you're at. Again, if you have to 
um, submit your, your financials to the bank for loans. Um, that's another thing you, you really do need to have those, we call them interim financial statements. So that might be for the first six months of the year, or right now it'd be for the first nine months of the year. That would be something that it would be helpful if you knew. <laughs> um, Software. Software is great. Um, I am also a QuickBooks Pro advisor like Dolly and um, do use QuickBooks a fair amount. Most people buy it because it's cheap and easy and a lot of accountants know it. A lot of bookkeepers, a lot of accountants. You know, it, it's just a really used, well-used software. So um, on the software, you definitely, it would be faster and more accurate. Usually if you had automated fees into your cash accounts and into your credit card accounts, you can do that with QuickBooks. QuickBooks Online, you can also do it with QuickBooks Desktop. It's pretty easy to set up and it just makes things a lot more easy than you just have to code each one of the um, expenses or income items that come through. It's pretty straightforward. Um, again, a bookkeeper can do that pretty seamlessly and very easily. And um, the last thing you want to think about for comparing your accounting records is think about your income statement. Um, so a lot of times I get an income statement from a client and it just has this year on it. Well, Okay, that, that's helpful. However, what would be really more helpful is to see last year's compared to this year's. And again, QuickBooks does a really nice job of creating a comparative income statement. And you can even add columns that um, talk about how much has it changed, how much percent has it changed. So those are great um, pieces. And so then you can have those bigger conversations of, geez, I don't have a lot of money, but I had a lot of sales. Why would that be? And we could have those conversations. Um, so those, that, that's about updating your accounting records. The, to segue into that, um, one of the things people say is just like I just said, so if, um, I have a lot of business and I'm doing really well, but for example, I don't have a lot of money in the bank. Why is that? Well, it could be that you're growing. You had to buy a lot of supplies. You're gearing up for a big show. You're, um, you had to buy some equipment maybe, um, that, that, can, can really affect your overall profitability because your expenses are higher than and coming in faster than your sales. So um, one of the things to keep track of is your balance sheet. It uh, To echo Dolly, it's what you own is your assets and what you owe are your liabilities. Um, the biggest things that um, I would tell a creative to, to think about are tracking your receivables in addition to cash. <laughs> uh, you wanna track your receivables. Uh, the people who owe you. Um, if you have a number of paintings that you sell on consignment to a gallery um, and you you need to be able to track where that inventory is, but also you might wanna track your receivables if you know about the sales. If you do sell wholesale in any way, um, again, that would be a great thing to be able to track is make sure you know who owes you so that you can keep on top of those collections and make sure that everybody's paying you in a timely manner. And you can just remind them if they're not paying you in a timely manner. Um, and you can also track payables. Uh, that, that, again, great uses of software. Software tracks your receivables. They track your payables. It's it's just a really, uh, I, I can't say enough about software. If you don't want to use software, Excel is a great option as well. Most people know how to use it. It's pretty cheap. It's basically free once you buy the program. Uh, so Excel is a good option as well. Um, and then I have income and expenses, do's and don'ts. So yeah, I have a lot of people that uh, try to try to tell me, you know, well, I just barter that service. Claim your income, uh, barter's income. Uh, if, if you're bartering something, you're gonna have an income and an offsetting expense. It's not gonna change your taxes. Um, just claim it. Um, you don't wanna have any conversations with a revenue officer, just not worth it. Uh, claim a crook, a pro, a cr appropriate expenses. Um, don't try to claim personal stuff. I have had an artist come to me and say, well, I want to, I want to go to a beach and collect sea glass and um, I want to go on a trip. <laughs> and while that's great and, and it's inspirational and that's true, it is inspirational. Absolutely true. However, it's a little bit dicey to claim that, that expense. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful about inspiration, I think is the biggest one that I see from creatives. Um, just make sure that you're really thoughtful about that and make sure it's a business purpose. Um, for example, on that Seagulass example, the, the guidance I read was that you needed to be keeping a detailed timesheet, logging what you did every single day, the, the pieces of Seagulass that you found to be able to use in your jewelry, and 
um, maybe some pictures as well, and basically keep a journal of your eight hours of for five days of combing the beach. So, <laughs> which is definitely a little bit more of a business thing than it is a pleasure thing. So, um, for most people anyway. Uh, so do think about that when you're claiming your expenses and work with your bookkeeper on that. Um, keep a mileage log. Uh, mileage log. So when you travel for business, if you travel to shows, if you travel to get supplies, if you travel to meet your accountant, um, you're going to keep a mileage log. It has a date where you traveled, basically what you did or who you spoke with or what kind basic basics about the meeting. I met with my accountant on my taxes. That's enough. That's all you need. Um, or I went to a show in, in Wickford something like that. Um, and then the mileage that you traveled, you're going to keep that ideally in some kind of app. Uh, you can handwrite it, but you probably should add it up for your accountant. <laughs> and then um, you can use that, that money at the end of the year, it, it would be an auto expense. Uh, typically, it's uh, under the standard, um, standard mileage rate for the IRS, which is basically about 54 cents a mile. And then um, that would be a nice expense that you could have for your business. Um, you want to keep your receipts. So when every time you make a business purchase, keep the receipt. You do not have to actually keep the physical receipt. You can scan it, um, but you want to keep those receipts. Um, and then the other thing you want to do is you want to make sure that when you have a business meal, again, you're keeping the receipt and you write, I like I write it right on mine, um, who I met with and the basic business purpose of what, what, um, what, what would the meal, why the meal was business. <laughs> and um, you can absolutely claim that as a business expense as long as it is a business meal. Um, don't claim home office for your spare room uh, unless you use it as a studio. So Hollis, I bet you has a, has a beautiful studio that is perfect for just her creative activity. That would be a great example of a home office. Um, know the rules about employees and, and independent contractors. Uh, know if you're hiring somebody, if you basically control what they do and how they do it and when they do it and with what materials, if with your materials, you have an employee. <laughs> um, other, other examples are you hire somebody to, you subcontract out, you have a big job. Um, I heard you had a pottery. So if you subcontract out because you have a huge order and it's not an art order, it's a straight up, you know, uh, vase order, um, something like that, where you have to sub it out because you, you want to get it done in time, that would be an independent contractor. So, and you have 1099 requirements on that. Again, just talk to your accountant about how to manage all of that. Um, and then plan for your, re your estimated taxes, roughly a third of your income. Sorry. <laughs> um, when you're sole proprietor, that's basically um, what it ends up being with the, with the self-employment tax, as well as the income tax. And then the other thing you can talk to your bookkeeper about, you can talk to your, um, your CPA about, is alternative business structures. Maybe you don't want to be a sole proprietor anymore. Maybe, maybe there are some other opportunities for you um, to incorporate. You can incorporate as an LLC, an S-Corp, and there are different taxation um, specifics with all that. So um, you want to talk through what makes the best sense for your, your structure from a tax perspective. And also you want to talk to your um, attorney about what makes the best sense from a, from a legal standpoint. Um, that's all I've got. So uh, on to Lisa Rich. Hi, everyone. How are you? Uh, give me just a second to change my screen. And I've got a couple of slides for you guys as well. Um, all right. There we go. And of course, I did what I always do, which is lost the screen with the faces on it. <laughs> <laughs> always seems to be a thing I do. All right. Let's see. And that's going to be. I have a feeling this is not going to do what I want it to do. Can you guys see my slides? Let's see. Do you see the real the slide or do you see the PowerPoint version? PowerPoint version. Ah, beesh. <laughs> they don't let me out of the home very often. See? That's what happens <laughs> to us. We're not very creative. We can't even turn the internet on. <laughs> 
try, we've got the slides. Let me take the slideshow off. Oh, not the slides. Anybody know any knock knock jokes? Keep it, <laughs> keep it light. <laughs> All right, I think we're in better shape now. Yes. Yes. Okay, we see real slides. All right, smashing. All right, guys. Um, I know you are. This is not your forte, and that's kind of <laughs> why I'm starting off with profit is not a four letter word. Uh, I think what typically happens with a lot of creatives is you are very passionate about your creativity. And therefore, uh, from a business perspective, you may find that your creative endeavor can sometimes be a black hole for money. And so while it may not be the heart of what you're doing, it's important that you, if, you're, if it's a hobby, you wanna at least break even on your hobby. And if you are looking to supplement your income, you actually make money doing that. And so, kind of tell you a little bit about, and there's a very high level, we're not going to bore you with accounting terminology and things that most of you don't have any interest in whatsoever. Um, but basically, you generate income from the work that you do. Doesn't matter what kind of work, if you're into pottery, you're doing glass, um, if you're painting. Um, some of you, I did notice somewhere in the chat, someone mentioned something about teaching. So some of you, <clears throat> excuse me, might teach along with selling your art at shows. Doesn't matter for, for tax purposes. Uncle Sam doesn't care where you got the money from. He just wants you to include it in all of your income. For this purpose, if this is all related to art, if everything that you're doing is you're teaching art, if you're doing the art, you all really wanna put it all into one place. So you're gonna, that's all your revenues in. So if you're using that cool spreadsheet that Hollis has, all the revenues, all the dollars in are gonna go and that's your income or your revenue. Some team, people use those things interchangeably or your sales, all interchangeable words. Underneath that, you're gonna have expenses. What did you spend money on? You bought paintbrushes, you bought pottery, you bought canvas, um, you bought packaging to ship your product um, with some, someone purchased from you. Those are all expenses to you. And again, if you've got the cool spreadsheet that Hollis has or you're using QuickBooks, whatever, those are all expenses and those all get listed. You want to include all of those things. Those are the things that, going back to what the other ladies mentioned, you don't want to wait to do this all in March when you're scrambling to get all of your stuff over to your tax person. There are two reasons. Number one, it'll make your eyeballs bleed and you'll spend probably a whole Saturday and half a Sunday trying to do it and you'll hate it and you'll never want to do it again. The other thing is, is that if you are trying to make a little bit of money doing this, you really want to keep track of this stuff every month so that you know if you actually are profitable in what you're doing. And again, very simple, profit, less expense. Hopefully, I mean, revenue, less expense, hopefully is profit. So again, you want your income to be greater than your expenses. It's not rocket science. We don't want you to think about it as rocket science, yes from a, an accounting and business perspective, we can make it super complex for you because Lisa and I know we work on clients that are complicated and, and that's not that this is meant to be. We want you to just keep track of your information so that you know what's going on in your business. And it is a business for most of you and that you can make decisions. You know, the last, it, it, and, and I say profit isn't a four letter word because I know for you guys, it, it may be. You know, if you are profitable in your art, it gives you permission really to, to do more art and, and, and take on more projects and do more of what you love. Um, if it is coming out of your pocket and frankly, if you can't make money doing it, then it's not as enjoyable for you anymore. So, you know, we want to kind of put that to the side that it doesn't make you a bad person that you sold out because you, you know, want to make money. If you make money, then you can make more art. And that's really what it's all about. And so how do you make more money? So some basic tips. So like anything else, you want to create financial goals. You, you do it with everything else in your lives, whether it's personal related, if, it's, um, if you're doing your art on the side and you have a day job, right? You probably have goals at that job. So you want to create financial goals around your art. 
So kind of going back to Hollis's sheet, she had goals every month she wanted to do. Um, in the example she dropped in, she's got goals of what she wants to do in revenues per month. And if you're doing different things, if you are you know, selling at galleries and maybe you're selling at shows or maybe you're teaching, maybe you want to break those out, right? But you have a goal. I have a goal for to make so much money a month um, in teaching and so much and, and selling my art at shows and so on. So really create goals. And then once you've created those goals and because now you're tracking your information on a monthly basis, you can go back and compare your goals, right? Say, this was my goal. This is where I landed. You know, what's, what's different, what's going on? Because the reality is you'll be able to now make decisions about future things that you want to do in your art business. The next is set up a financial system. Again, doesn't have to be elaborate. Excel typically works. If you have a little bit more going on, you are a little bit busy, you've got a number of different revenue streams, you may want to consider utilizing one of the automated systems, something like Quick, <coughs> excuse me, QuickBooks Online. Um, many creatives like FreshBooks because FreshBooks conveys the financial information in, in, in a way that you may be able to digest a little bit easier. On the flip side, your accountant's going to hate it, just saying. <laughs> Um, track your cash flow, cash in, cash out. If there's no money in your bank account, then there's something going on. But if you aren't tracking that, you don't know. And so you don't want to make this elaborate. It doesn't need to be elaborate. And that's the other thing I want to tell all of you. Keep it simple. Do not overcomplicate this because you will not want to deal with it or do it or have any, any business with it if you try it, if you overcomplicate it. So keep it simple. Honestly, the Excel sheet for the early, for early adopters is, is absolutely sufficient. Create an art business plan. It doesn't have to be complex either. It could be a simple two-page lean business, business plan that break, breaks, up, breaks out kind of like, what's your why? You know, um, what's your competitive, like what's your marketplace? Who are your ideal customers? Right. All the basic, like the top four or five sections of an art, you know, of a basic business plan. It doesn't really have to be 100 pages long, but just document what you want to do, what your goals are. And that's a really great place to do that because now you've got something. And I say written, it doesn't have to be handwritten. It could be there are automated products out there. Um, there's a wonderful website called bplans.com where you can get templates and things. And there's a great, you know, two page where you can, you know, PDF that you can type your, your, um, your goals into. That gives you a place to go back to once a quarter, half a year, and look and say, oh, you know, this is what I was on, you know, on track to do, or this is what I want to do. And really giving you an opportunity to go back and, and look at what you thought was going to happen. Because that's one of the things that Lisa, myself, the other Lisa, myself, and Dolly do is we're also looking at those things when we work with our clients. What did they expect to happen and what really happened? And so it helps them to really create and be able to do the things they want to do and make the decisions they want to in their business. The other thing is be realistic about your time and your labor. I did notice that somebody dropped in the chat earlier um, a question about how much do you know, like what to put your pay yourself on, on the forecast. The reality is that you actually put a number on there. You, you have to do that because what happens too often is you don't correlate your time with money. And if you really think about it, if somebody else did that for you, if you had someone helping you, you would have to pay them. And so what would you be paying them? So you really want to think about what you are spending, the time that you're spending in your money, in your business, and the labor that you're putting in. And you want to account for all of those things. And why do you want to do those things? The next thing, prices. I'm going to guess there's a really big chunk of you who are not charging the right prices because you are undervaluing what it is that you do. But one of the great things about knowing what time and labor that you've put into, you can now create a solid price structure for yourself because you've considered how much time that you are going to put in to create that piece, right? And when you convey what it is that you do to people, they see the value of what you do because now they understand what went into that. But if you don't consider that when you're creating it and you're spending your money and you're creating your art and really thinking about your pricing, that's the piece that gets left off. And at the end of the day, you really aren't as profitable as you would like to be. The other thing is, is you know, 
in many cases, some of you probably want to decrease your expenses. We all do it. We get giddy about the things that we love. I'm a software geek. So when it comes to software and, you know, I've got all kinds of subscriptions to all kinds of crazy things, half of them I'm not using in my business. So take a look back now that you're tracking your expenses, you can look back at your expenses and say, hey, what am I spending my money on? Oh, you know, um, Hollis is a painter. So she probably loves to buy brushes. But does she really need more brushes? Probably not. So those are things you really need to look back on. Why? Now, because you've tracked all of that information. You have that info monthly, quarterly, throughout the year. You're not just guessing. You know, the other thing, and it kind of goes hand in hand with the other spend wisely, really think about what you're spending your money on. You know, what do you have to sell? Um, how much do you have to sell? Going back to your goals in order to be able to afford all the trinkets, the toys, the more, the new fun tools uh, that, or equipment that you could potentially get uh, to do your art. Think about that, right? Like how much do I have to sell? How much do I have to teach? And really go back into that place and think about what you're spending your money on in your, in your business. Um, and then, you know, be smart about selling your art. Same thing as going back to your prices, right? How often, you know, I find when I work with individuals in the service space, they cut their prices in order to sell something or to get a client or to really think about what, you know, your value is and, and learning to convey your value to, to clients and to customers and, and really sharing your art with them. Um, but be smart about it. You know, don't always cut prices to sell a piece. Um, you know, and one of the things I actually jotted down in my, in my notes, like while we were chatting too, which isn't on here, um, don't make it hard for people to pay you. And that kind of goes back to cash flow. You want to make it easy for them to pay you. You know, if you think that they're just going to write you a check, the days of people just writing checks are gone. I have this conversation with clients all the time. Um, give them the opportunity to pay you electronically in some fashion, whatever that is, Venmo, PayPal, whether you're using QuickBooks Online invoicing and they pay you through there. Don't make it hard for them to pay you um, because if, they, if it's hard, there's a really good chance that they may not be interested in actually purchasing from you. You want them to be able to be excited about giving you money. Um, and, you know, and for a lot of you, you might want to focus on your retail sales, right? Some of you might be looking to sell wholesale. Um, when you sell wholesale, that's, you know, you've got to realize at that point, you're not selling kind of that up priced product. You're reducing your price so that your wholesaler has some margin when they sell it. So that may be an opportunity to get some steady cash flow in, but that might not be the best route for you to be truly profitable and make enough money. So it might be something to kind of think about how you diversify how you sell, but typically selling retail will probably bring you more money. And the last thing is know your numbers. Know exactly what you're spending in order to make, you know, make that for those of you that are you know, in pottery, how much does it cost you to make that vase, that plate, whatever that piece is that you've made for a customer? It's important for you to know those things. Your revenue are not your profits because there's expenses you have to consider. Cash is not your profit either. There's a lot of accounting kind of hokiness that may fall into there. You may have timing issues where you spent money on all of this stuff and built up your inventory. But the reality is doing that all now because you're going to go out in December and sell at a bunch of Christmas shows. Well, guess what? you're not gonna have any cash in the bank right now because you spent all of your money trying to build up your inventory to have inventory for the Christmas shows. So again, cash isn't profit. And the last is profits are not cash. So it's not interchangeable. Just because the bottom of that profit and loss statement, so that's what it's called, is says that you are profitable doesn't mean you have cash in the bank. Same thing, goes back to that inventory. You are building up your inventory right now to go do Christmas shows, you've spent a ton of money. So kind of think about it that way, but it's important for you to know your number. It may be a creative business, but if you want to continue to be able to share your art with people, you have to be really mindful and smart about where you spend your money and, and so that you can perpetuate your art and, and continue to create for years and years. Um, that's kind of my stick a little bit about me. I am a certified public accountant, just like the other Lisa is. Um, I've been in practice for about 20 years now. I have a boutique practice. We pretty much 
support, mostly my niche is construction. So I tend to work with larger companies. Um, we do bookkeeping, tax, advisory. For you, advisory is, is budgeting, forecasting, all the things that you don't like, but my construction clients don't like it any, any more than you do. Um, and so, but it's important. You know, this is something when I work with clients, we work all year round and we're looking at their numbers so they aren't surprised. Because you don't want to be surprised when you get that potential tax bill at year end. You want to know kind of where you stand. And the other thing is, is you're going to hate tax time if you wait to do all of your numbers all before you go to do your tax return. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks to our panelists so far. Um, and <clears throat> what I'd like to, um, we're going to get to the questions in a second. Um, I do want to clarify too that um, we know that some of you are not here because you want to hire a bookkeeper, um, but you want to be able to do this on your own, or at least start by doing this on your own. That's one of the reasons we brought Hollis in. Um, so we want you to ask questions in relation to that, as well as, as um, <clears throat> you know, if you're thinking about hiring a bookkeeper. Um, but uh, so we have several questions in the, um, <clears throat> in the chat. I'm going to start with uh, Barbara Healy asked a question. Um, Barbara, I'm unmuting you or asking you to unmute. Um, and you can ask your question and any follow-ups you need. Hi, well, I, th I think she answered it already that your teaching income goes in the same revenue as um, sales. I didn't know if I had to separate them. You don't, for tax purposes, no, you don't have to. But when you're analyzing where where you make your most money and you're trying to determine where the best place to kind of put yourself because your most valuable is, it's nice to have it broken out so that you can understand where your revenues are coming from. So for your personal self and understanding how profitable you are and how profitable your business is, you would want to break them out, but for tax purposes, you do not need to break them out. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next up, we have Michelle Clark. Um, oops, I just lost her. I uh, had her there a second. No, I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Trying to set you up for unmuting. Oh, there you are. You, <laughs> okay, I, you, you are unmuted. Good. Great. Okay. <laughs> That's why you jumped. <laughs> okay. So, so, so it's a two-part question, um, and I and I it was just mentioned a little bit earlier. How, so the first part of the question actually is the one I'm most interested in now. How do you decide how much to pay yourself when you've got, you know, significant fluctuations in what your revenue and income may be quarter to quarter or month to month? And you said, yes, you do have to state that up front in your forecast. Um, and I guess my, so the second part of that is still relevant. Can you decide that quarter to quarter or month to month? Or do you have to basically say at the beginning of the year what you think that number will be? Thank you. That, I mean, honestly, that number, if, especially in the, this type of business, is going to flux. So that's where you're forecasting what you think you're going to spend in subsequent months really becomes key. Because you want to think about, G in two Two months, three months, I'm going to need to spend a bunch of money on, I don't know, what, whatever. I mean, again, you could, you could be sitting in August and say, I have money right now, but I know I'm going to do a bunch of Christmas fairs and shows. So I'm going to really need to have money put to the side right now to start to build my inventory and, and make pieces, you know, or, or whatever it is. And so you may not in August draw a salary that large to pay yourself because you know you're going to need that cash in a couple of months. And so it can flux. Once you have a business that is a little bit more predictable, um, you can potentially take something, steady something every, you know, every other week, you know, once, twice a month, whatever it is. Um, but I mean, at that point, it be, just becomes more of like a planning, right? I'm going to need X dollars moving forward. I have this. This is the difference. Okay, I can, you know, take a salary of Y because that's the difference between the numbers. So that's where your planning really comes into play. It's not just, oh, I have $8,000 in my bank account, my business account. I can take that and pay myself 8000 
no, you're going to have expenses coming up in subsequent months. What do you think you're going to bring in in those months? And what do you think needs to go out? And so that's where it becomes this level of cash flow planning. It's kind of like, how's it, you know, teetering in and out of my bank account so that I know what to pay myself. So it's not in a business at flux. It's, it's, it's a little bit of an art. Um, once you've got a business that is more steady, it becomes more of a science. So I think what I hear you saying is that it's okay, you know, at the, at the end of the quarter or the end of the year that you've paid yourself different amounts of money in different months. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Like for, you know, people like the, you know, myself, Lisa and Dolly, we work with clients on a monthly basis. We're getting revenues in on a monthly basis. Therefore, you know, we can draw a salary every two weeks and get paid every two weeks like an employee would because we know that it's steadily coming in every month. If the revenue was all coming in like three months and then nothing for like a month or two or slow for a month or two, no, you really start to think about, gee, I could pay myself well in these three months because I have more revenues, but in these other months down here, I might need to slow my salary down a little bit because I don't have as much cash flow and kind of vice versa, so. And there's no requirement about yeah. what exactly you have to pay. That's the other piece. Great, thank you. Unless you have an S corp and it needs to be reasonable comp, but we won't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> we won't torture you with that one. No, but if I'm a sole proprietor LLC, it sounds like I have a lot of flexibility. You do. Yeah. You're, you're a schedule C. So basically you'd be drawing out of your business. You're taxed on whatever the profit of the business is, regardless mm -hmm. if you took a penny out of it. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Next up is um, Karen Zukas. Um, Karen, unmute yourself. Hi. Hi, Karen. Hello. So let's see if I can find my question. <laughs> um, oh, yes. <clears throat> so is the amount of income tax the same? Do you pay the same for services provided as you would for um, products that you sell? You know, I mean, I know that we pay six and a half percent income tax when we purchase something. So I'm just not clear if, I'm just not clear. I should, I could Google it, I suppose, but it would be nice to ask. <laughs> or will you no. <laughs> you're, so the six and a half percent you're talking about is sales tax. Right. So that's what you, we would all pay sales tax on products, right? We go to Target, we buy whatever. So, you know, uh, towels, we pay sales tax on all of those things. What you're talking about is income tax at year end on your, your 1040, that tax return you file. Is that what you're talking about? Um, I, I guess I need to know how much to put aside for taxes at the end of the year, you know, or per quarter. You know, we pay, I pay teachers. I get, uh, we provide a service of, of teaching classes, of mostly lots of classes. And so I pay teachers, but that's, but, but I don't know how to pay taxes on it. I, you know, I don't understand the concept of, of it yet, of income tax from my side of things. <laughs> yeah, you've got a couple of different things going on that I'm, I'm thinking you're, so you're paying your teachers as contractors? I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I could hear, I could hear three or so different things rolling around in there. So <laughs> your teachers, your sounds like you're probably paying them as a subcontractor, which I'm not going to, we're not going to go into the employee versus contractor thing, but be mindful if they're employees, you need to be paying payroll taxes on those, which is another process, in, which is outside of kind of. But I don't think they are because they don't really make more than, you know, a few thousand dollars a year from teaching with us. No, yeah, that doesn't. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't mean anything. No. No. Yeah, that is seasonal. That's the other one that has no bearing on anything. Yeah. So <laughs> if like, I'm not sure who mentioned, I think it was Lisa was that mentioned it. <laughs> yeah. So your teachers, if you're telling them where to be, when to be there, what they teach, how they're going to teach it, you're doing all of that. They're technically your employees, at which point you would need to pay them as employees and withhold taxes on their behalf and pay taxes as the, the employer. 
And that's a tax system in itself. So sales tax is one thing. So we pay sales tax, you go get that coffee at Dunkin Donuts, you're gonna pay the six and a half or six and a quarter percent sales tax on that coffee. When you're an employee, you have tells from your paycheck, but what most employees don't know is the employer has to pay some money in to social security as well. So you pay the employee, plus there's some payroll tax you pay with that. So that's what's considered payroll taxes. Now, after all of that is said and done, you personally probably have income and therefore you have an income tax that you pay on your tax return that you file either by yourself or with a spouse at year end. That tax rate could be all over the place depending on what your status is. If you have a spouse that works, um, there's a whole slew of things that go in there. So you kind of got three different things rolling in that one question that you asked. Right. I still find it very difficult to, to accept, let's just say, that if someone's making say $400 a year from teaching for us, that I would have to file some, you know, um, serious paperwork, you know? So, but, I, but you're yes, saying I do. That has nothing to do with it. Yeah, that has nothing but to that do with being, it. That being, when you say that has nothing, that being the amount that they make? Correct. Right. Unless, the, unless they're a subcontractor, then your obligation is $600 or more on a 1099. But other than that, I mean, yeah, you're, you could um, think of, of, and I'm gonna go back to my Dunkin' Donuts example, all of those kids working in that Dunkin' Donuts, so they tend to turn those kids over like crazy, right? They, they may pay them for a week or two, maybe $100, $200. They still have to file payroll and payroll taxes on those on those kids that are serving you that coffee, regardless of how much money they made there. And so that's the way you got to kind of think about it. It doesn't matter. Karen, maybe yeah. I can, Karen, maybe I can clarify just a little bit too. Um, Thank you. Partly it's, it's how you make the arrangement. So if you're saying to a teacher, I would like somebody to teach um, ceram a ceramics class, you pick the, the you know, you, you, I have the facility, you decide when you want to teach it and what kind of ceramics you want to teach um, mm -hmm. and how long you want it to run for. If that's what you, your arrangement is with the teacher, then you are hiring a subcontractor. You're not hiring an yeah, employee. Absolutely. Right, so mm -hmm. it's a subcontractor. And so are the rules different with a subcontractor? You still have a reporting requirement at your end. And okay. if you pay them more than $600, you're required to fill out something that's called a 1099. Okay, and basically so basically you report back what they've earned to them on that 1099 and you file it with internal revenue. Okay, and if it's under that, then I'm not required to file one for them. Correct, you're not obligated to file. Okay, so that's utilizing one of these softwares, QBO, whatever, they, they'll file them all directly out of there. So it, it, it minimizes the manual labor that you have to put into prepping them that makes it a lot easier but other than that no unless you pay them more than six hundred dollars yeah it's not that's why i'm that's why it sounds su superfluous to have to go through all that it's not the money honestly it's just the the, the time and energy and effort mm -hmm. to have to do that so um i'm sorry i don't mean to take up a lot of time but i no but i'm sure people it? find this interesting they might they might have similar or, or, you know arrangements so this i think is all helpful to everyone okay and, also, and Karen, you yes. you had a question about um how do you know what to pay for estimates so my, my rule is like a third of your income basically just on your self-employment income so let's just just that piece basically set aside a third so work with your accountant make sure you're paying an estimates if you make money my rule of thumb is 10 grand. If you start making serious money, like 10 grand or more, talk to your accountant about paying in estimates. <laughs> yeah. Because you will have an unpleasant time in April if you don't. <laughs> Thank you. Especially if you have income from other places and if you are married, you have a spouse, if he has income somewhere else, yeah. it can get quite expensive. And you do not, like, we do not want to have that conversation. Like, we are not popular with those. <laughs> <laughs> this is very unpopular. <laughs> yep. Also, one one other thing from the way you were asking the question, Karen, um, if 
you're selling things and you're providing the teaching service, for example, um, you've got two different kinds of income coming in. But when you sell, sell something and you pay the sales tax and you send that sales tax on to the, um, to the government and then you pay whoever made the material um, that you just sold, the difference between, um, between what you pay the person and what you made on the sale, regardless of the sales tax, is income as well. So you need to consider that income when you're considering all your other income. So, but just the part that is the profit on the sale, not the sales tax. That's not, that's a separate piece entirely, um, which I know from running a gallery and doing other things. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah, all right. We I'm have, sure I don't have other questions, but I'll let other people. Yeah, no, we have other questions coming. Um, hang on, I, I uh, get, have to get to the next question because it scrolled off the screen because other people put some stuff in. Um, okay. Uh, Nona Morris uh, put a question in that she wants us to read. Um, can you please give an example of how to re uh, record barter arrangements as income? Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'll take that one because I talked about barter. Um, so it depends on what your software or Excel or however you're recording. So if you're using Excel, my suggestion is to record income on one row, record that you have a barter arrangement and record income as a positive number and record neg expenses however you normally do that. If you do them negative, put it negative. If you put it positive, put it positive. And, whatever, and so it would be in whatever category you bartered for. So um, so if you had, I'm going to teach a class if you give me these pots, for example. So you'd have teaching income would be the positive, and then the um, materials, supplies would be the negative, something like that. If you're using software, you're probably going to, the easiest way would be a journal entry. Um, you might need your bookkeeper <laughs> to help you with that because there's, you um, these things called debits and credits, and they can get a little bit overwhelming for people. Um, but basically, we would use, normally use a journal entry. Uh, I suppose you could use a check, a zero check, and try to create something. But again, if you work with your bookkeeper, that would be easy. I think also in relation to that, <clears throat> part of it is um, pricing both sides of the transaction. Well, in my opinion, um, whatever you exchanged is an equal value because that's why you exchanged it. So it would be the same amount of income and the same amount of expense. Um, just to complicate things, if you did do more than $600, you're supposed to issue a 1099B for barter. Um, I don't know that anybody ever does, but uh, <laughs> that's what you're supposed to do. Um, similar to the 1099 series, it's due in January. Um, but, but basically, yes, you'd record income of $500 or whatever it is that you got a value or what you normally would have taught your class for or sold your product for or whatever it is. So hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> All right. Our next question is from Angela Chang. Angela, can you unmute yourself and uh, <clears throat> ask your question? She signed on on her phone. Does that change things? Uh, oh, hello. Hi. Sorry. It's just my uh, Wi-Fi is kind of slow. I hope I'm coming through okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, so my question is, how do you know when you need to incorporate? I've been doing uh, like a, a side hustle for uh, about three years now, and it's starting to have consistent income, you know, uh, like 30 or $40 a month. And I think I might ramp up a little bit bit more because of the pandemic and have more time on my hands. When should we start since counting it as like real income rather than hobby income? Like when do I need to incorporate and take more formal, uh, make a more formal accounting? Well, um, I don't think you, I, I don't think you have to change anything. Um, Yay. I, I, I don't think you do. Um, you can be a sole proprietor and make $400,000. There's no 
actual dollar limit on it. The, <laughs> if you're making substantial money, um, you might want to incorporate, but that would be for probably legal reasons rather than anything else. I mean, there is a, there is a different taxation. Um, not if you are a sole member LLC, that's fairly similar. However, if you're an S corp and you incorporate as a, as a C or an S corporation, then you have to run payroll. You, they, they're just, you have to do a separate tax return. So it can get pretty expensive. And so if you don't have a need, I, I usually tell people not to worry about incorporating. I agree with Lisa. I'd same thing. Don't, don't complicate it if you don't have to. Um, I guess my only thought would be, depending on what you're doing, um, if you feel like there's a legal liability associated with what you do, then you might want to organize as an LLC just for legal purposes, not necessarily mm -hmm. to protect yourself. Um, but honestly, no, I've seen, to be fair, I have seen uh, too many people come through as S-Corps in recent years that need to be somebody or incorporated them that they didn't, it was, it's, it's elaborate. It's unnecessary. They were spending money on tax prep and, and all kinds of insanity. And it was, they should have never been incorporated. So keep it simple. Um, and again, if you start to make a significant amount of net profit, then you may want to explore another option in, in, in a tax savings type of effort, at which point you absolutely need to have a, a conversation with an attorney as well as a CPA to understand, you know, what that means to you. But I agree with Lisa, once you get up into significant dollars, I typically advise, and I mean significant, 75,000 in net, net, not gross, net, like 75 to 100,000, then we're usually talking about moving them out of a sole prop and into some sort of corp of some kind. But that's just for tax savings purposes and trying, you know, mm -hmm. trying other tax savings op options. Um, but when you're small and it's a side hustle, don't complicate it. Don't. Awesome. Don't Thank it. you. That's a no. great <laughs> question, uh, answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> Karen Zukas has a follow up question to the earlier discussion. Thank you. So I'm really interested in doing everything the right way, but actually I do like to keep things simple. So I'd like to keep it simple as long as possible, unless I'm there. I'd also like to be making money, but um, so should I, when I, when I hire a teacher, even though they're independent, be giving them a 1099 form to fill out or somehow other, some other way collecting their, yeah, okay. And then yeah, and the, minute, them. the minute you hire them as part of your onboarding process, you should obtain a W-9 from them that has their information on it. Oh, it's a W-9? Okay. Yeah, that's so what I called it, the W-9. Yeah. And where do I get, do you, I'm sorry, but do you know where I get them? I just Google, get them online? Literally Google W-9 and it will pop up right there on your, on your Google. No, and they're, and they're, and they're, oh. and they're, su they're super easy to fill out. So you're not asking them to do some onerous thing. Yeah, it's okay. to name your address and if they have an EIN, the EIN, and if not, then their social security number. That's it. EIN is a is an independent crunch. Yeah, none of them sure. Well, maybe. But um, so and it's six hundred dollars. That's the max I can get it, you know, not get away with, but that's the max that they that okay. Correct. <laughs> I want to address that one. <laughs> yeah, but you're not getting away with anything, but no, no, I don't. I don't mean to get away. You know, I, I don't know what else to how else to say it. I don't know the language of. of, of Regardless, <laughs> if they got five ninety nine from you. Technically, they're supposed to report that on their tax return. I mean, mm -hmm. the reality is most people aren't, but you might want to give them a ten ninety nine to cover your behind. Honestly, they are required to report it. Say that again. They are required to report it. Now, the good news is. If they have less than $400 of self-employment income, they're not paying self-employment tax. So if you give somebody a 1099 with 400 bucks on it, they do have to put a Schedule C on their return. However, <laughs> you do not owe any extra tax other than the income on 400 bucks, which is going to be minimal. So, um, I mean, that'd be minimal. <laughs> so, but they, they do actually have a filing requirement, all income from all sources. Okay. I have another question then. Do I, 
do I need to deduct taxes then from the teachers that I pay, even though I know for sure that I'm not paying them for more than four hundred dollars a year? Not if they're not if they're an employee, yes. If they're not an employee, no. Okay, but I do have to give them a form, and so then in the end, if they just in case they do make more, then what do I do? I'm out the tax. There's no tax to you. You're just you're filing a form. So if you paid them a thousand dollars for the year, you're they're going to get a 1099 at year end for a thousand dollars. Oh, you so they're going to yeah, that's okay. their responsibility. Once that bad boy goes out the door, that's not your responsibility anymore. It's theirs, and they have to report okay. it. And that's the reason why I oh. say you probably just want to give them one and gets it off of your table and puts it in there. Yeah, and give them a warning that that about it because I want to be frank and upfront with them. Of course, I don't want to. I just don't know, Frank. Yeah. You know, so now I do, though. I know now. So thank you. Somebody told me eight thousand dollars. I don't know why. Maybe it was a not for profit or something. I'm not sure. I know. I know. I know. Wow. I, know. I don't know. I've been doing this a long time. Eight thousand has never been a number on mine. I don't know. What about you, Lisa? Was it always? Is it, it was the eight. Like not me. Well, then I'm really grateful that I, came, that I tuned in tonight because I, I appreciate your help and, I, and I'm glad. No problem. The reality of it. Okay, um, we have some other questions. Um, Rhonda, I'm not sure what your question is actually in reference to. So can you unmute yourself and, and um, yeah. clarify? Yeah, um, the, um, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, you were talking before about incorporating yourself. What would be the reason you don't want to incorporate yourself? When you say keep it simple. Yeah. Just so why would you, you once you incorporate your you there are additional compliance related activities you have to do you have to file a lot more forms every year. Okay. In most cases, more pay? forms require more CPAs and more money, and so it becomes. Oh, I'm with you. Keeping it simple is better. Yeah, or an attorney to incorporate, right? So you pay the attorney to incorporate, and there's an annual yeah. report to the state that you operate in. And then yeah. there's a tax return to that state. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, the incorporation itself can be costly from that perspective, right? So you're filing all these forms and paying all these guys because everybody wants their, everyone's got their hand out. They all want their money. So from that perspective, you may not, because it may not make sense to do all of these crazy filings and spend all this money on all these things if you're only you know, making so much money. Now, okay. if you are making more money, then yes, that's where the incorporation becomes potentially a tax saving tool. I'm not saying it will be, but it potentially becomes a tax saving tool that you may want to explore because you might be interested in saving those tax dollars. So that's where the planning comes into play. Okay, good. That That's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, you've convinced me to keep it absolutely as simple as possible. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I do have another, another uh, thing, I, oversight on my part. I just got a grant and I paid people over the summer. Well, when I got the check mm -hmm. to, to um, I brought them in to teach, you know, to assist me. Mm -hmm. And I paid them, but I didn't ask for a 1099. And I have to pay, I have to use 1099s all the time. So my I completely so I forgot go about them it. Now, go back to them now and request that they complete a W-9 so you have yeah. your information. Yeah. And then at, at year end, you can have, you know, you can do their 1099s to provide to them. I just recommend when you do an onboarding process with anyone you take on to support you in your business, that yeah. they complete that W-9 through that onboarding. They don't get a penny from you until they do a W-9 yeah. so that you have yourself covered. Um, yeah. Maybe you don't know if you're going to give them $600 or more. I would just grab it and get it anyway so that you're not yeah. chasing in January looking for that information. Yeah, I mean, I'm listening to this going, oh my God, I didn't do it. I do it <laughs> for myself to people that pay me. I didn't do it for myself. Yeah, it, it's it's crazy. Yeah, sometimes you don't think of it, right? Because you're, you're getting them from other people. But when you kind of the foot, like the you know the shoes on the other foot, you're like, oh, that's right, I have to do this. So yeah, it, um, it, mm -hmm. it it's just something you, I would recommend creating. I call it an onboarding process, but basically, um, I'm you sure you have some sort of arrangement with them. Maybe they yeah. find something to be working in your space, and so to protect yeah. yourself 
legally, you know, so nothing happens if they fall or whatever. Yeah. If that's something you do with them, then I would include that W-9 with that process when they sign whatever agreement they have with you. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that this just blew my mind. I just totally spaced. And Rhonda, since you're um, new to issuing them for yourself, um, you may consider if you don't have a software that'll do it quickly and easily, they have a lot of um, online services like Eagle View will, is a good one. Um, and you, you just go in, you enter your information, you enter their information, and you can actually have the service mail the form, file it with the IRS, you know, that kind of thing. It's really helpful. And it's yeah, pretty it's, cheap. It, it, That's it's amazing. Yeah. What is it? I think I, the one I use is was it E1099 or eBiz, E1099 e biz or whatever. And it, I think it maybe is four or $5 per 1099. And it's yeah. worth, it's worth the money because I don't have to deal mm -hmm. with it. I drop the stuff in the software online and poof, it goes off where mm -hmm. it needs to. So it takes the piece out of your hand. Yep. You know, what's really good too, is um, all the, you know, like square, they, they do all the taxes for you. They, you, you, they print something out at the end of the year. Yeah. You know, do you think they would do that with 10 I don't know. They should. <laughs> I, I don't think they do that. I, I know they'll issue you one, <laughs> but yeah. um, I, think I haven't heard of them processing 1099s. Yeah. And I would, I would say if you use, I don't know if FreshBooks does it. I know QuickBooks Online does. Mm -hmm. You can do the 1099 through there at your end, mm -hmm. um, which is nice because it basically tracks back to what you paid them and it, it kind of pulls everything in and simplifies certain aspects of it. Um, FreshBooks mm -hmm. might do something comparable. I, I don't know. You'd have to check. Um, there are a lot of products now that help you. It, those are the kinds of pieces that they start to lump into these financial products where you can kind of do that type of thing quicker. Yeah. And what, if there's no more, if there isn't any more questions pressing, I have one more. Go ahead, Rhonda, and then we have a couple of others, yeah. Okay. In terms of grants, I, I receive a lot of a lot of grants to perform work. What is it with the taxes and grants? Like, how does that work? Because now I have to start paying attention to it more for myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to <laughs> grab that, Lisa? <laughs> all income from all sources, my friend. <laughs> that is how they got Al Capone. <laughs> he didn't pay his taxes from all the uh, extortion and everything. So that's how they, they put him in jail for that. Um, yeah, if you have grants, unless for some reason they are special, like pandemic grants, um, you got to check with your CPA on that. But um, but mostly grants are taxable. Mm. You know, if you're in Rhode Island, basically they were all taxable this year. The yeah. only ones that really weren't were a PPP loan. That's it. You know, that's interesting because I one of the grants I did get um, because I received unemployment, I literally called them up. I said, listen, I got this grant. Do I have? It, they go, no, it's all you're all you're all good. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, what how does that work with all the other grants that I get? You mm -hmm. know, you didn't have to so, report it to unemployment. It doesn't right. mean uh, which, would have, which would have knocked down your benefits. You still yeah. have to report it as income. Those are two different things. Mm -hmm. Oh, see, that's really yeah. something. Yeah. They were answering your question from their point of view. They weren't thinking about your income taxes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> asking the question is really really a good point and it, it's really important that you work with your whoever uh with your yeah. bookkeeper accountant whoever it is if they're not asking you questions or you're not you're not asking them questions you guys need to talk yeah. to each other it's really yeah. important and Thank you. honestly if yeah. this is kind of like my little tip here if you have started a business and you now have a schedule c on your personal tax return please go find somebody that is qualified to help you do that tax return. Do not yeah. do it yourself. No, I because won't. Because many of you, we're all, I will tell you, and I will tell, I've had clients over the years that were very educated and could have done their tax return and didn't want to. And that's why they came to us. But the reality is a basic tax return using TurboTax, you know, you have a W-2 from an employer, you have a little bit of mortgage interest and real estate taxes. You probably can do your own tax return yourself following the prompts in TurboTax and you would be fine. Mm -hmm. Once you start to get outside of the realm of the basic pieces, 
you have a business, you own a rental property, you have investments, you've got a brokerage account, please, 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 please go see somebody yeah. and pay them to do your tax return because the cost associated with you going back and finding them two years later when you get a notice from the service because you weren't 100% positive how to do that tax return will be far more costly than having that tax prepared in that year. I've seen it. I've re represented <clears throat> people in front of internal revenue because they did their own tax return and they just, it cost $15,000, mm -hmm. $20,000 in adjustment. And had they just spent $800 to have us do their tax return, it would have been mm. far, far cheaper. So just when you get out of a basic, a, and I'm basic W-2s, you know, mortgage interest, real estate taxes, you start to get into different things. Seek advice from someone, please yeah. do yourself a favor. Yeah, you know, I, I've definitely done Schedule C's throughout, but I'm, I'm now I'm switching over. I actually have a... A business. Yeah. You, I, you, you should. The other thing is, is that you could potentially be missing expenses that you hadn't thought of if you weren't using that yeah. repair either. So it's kind of a, it's, it's a twofold. So yeah, that's just my recommendation to people is <laughs> work with somebody. You. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, Michelle has another question. Michelle Clark. Hi. So I started my sole proprietor LLC in Connecticut, and then I moved to the Cape full time. Does that change anything? I mean, I changed my address, obviously, in my records, but do I have to change anything else sort of accounting wise or tax wise? I believe so, you do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you've got a couple of different things. So from a tax perspective, you need to report that you're technically working in Massachusetts and selling in Mass now. So that's like a tax issue. The legalities, I don't know legally what yeah. you have to do. I think you have to move the LLC. You do. Um, mm -hmm. okay. You have to redomicile it. Okay. If it's an LLC. Now, you said sole proprietor LLC. So did when you I mean opened it, when, I opened it the, when I opened it, the sole proprietor LLC designation didn't exist yet. And so that's come in later and people tend to lump me in that because I don't have any employees or contractors. And, um, and but originally it was just opened up as sole proprietor, as, as an LLC. It wasn't sole proprietor, mm -hmm. but now people seem to be attaching that designation to it. Well, so yeah, we're gonna torture you with some more tax stuff. So the LLC is a legal vehicle only. It is not a tax vehicle. Okay. So basically, when you are an LLC, you have to pick a way to be taxed. Yep. So when someone says you're a sole proprietor LLC, you're what's called a single member LLC. You're one That's person. Yeah. So that one yep. person automatically defaults to a Schedule C. So if you are truly an LLC and you have an LLC, like you organize and you have ar articles of organization, no. I, I think what Lisa said, you're going to you do yep. not have articles of organization nope. Nope. and you are not an LLC, then you're simply a sole prop, a sole right. proprietor. So you don't mm -hmm. need to file Correct. any, you just have to say you have income in Massachusetts now, if that's where you're living. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Right. There are different rules. If you are an LLC, you would have to change your domicile. You'd have to work with the secretary of state's office to do that. Great. Um, it's not super complicated. It just can get, Annoying. <laughs> like anything. You don't see that at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we have a question from Lori Carmen. You want to unmute yourself and ask? <laughs> Hi. Um, so my question: mm -hmm. I just started a small business, and from what I understand, as soon as you name your business, the IRS wants you to report things, but. Um, I just wanted to know, I started this small business and I have expenses because I'm just starting out mm -hmm. and I don't have much income or any income at the moment. Um, at what point do I start reporting quarterly? <laughs> okay. A couple things. Um, if you're a new business, um, here's one of the things I would tell you that people don't realize, um, when you, and you will realize it when you set up your business uh, checking account, um, you have to register with your town. Um, good. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. And I, I yeah. 
Chinese um, checking account. So I've, I've done that, but I haven't filed anything because I wasn't okay. sure. If you are not incorporated, you do not have to file anything. You just have to file a Schedule C for income and expenses. If you just have expenses, there's not going to be an income tax associated with that. You have another issue. But until you get income, that's when the, the self-employment tax triggers. And that's when I say to people, look, you know, one third of your stuff, because you have an income tax, but also a self-employment tax, which is 15% plus the mass tax of five. So assuming you're in Massachusetts. So it's 4% in Rhode Island. So similar thing. So, you know, you, until you get income, you really don't need to pay estimates. And that's where I use that $10,000 bright line is sort of, that's where it's going to move the needle enough to make it hurt if you don't pay estimates in um, in April. You know what I mean? That, that's where you'll notice that self-employment tax come in. So even if you owe no tax, you'd still owe 15% of your earnings, right? your, your self-employment earnings. So that's, um, yeah, so that's sort of my bright line. Um, the other thing is when you have expenses that exceed your income, the first year, you know what? No big deal. <laughs> even the second year, no big deal. It's the third year that really, so three out of five years is what the IRS looks at for a, um, a bright line test of, are you running a hobby or are you running a business? And what they look at is how are you, how are you doing it? Are you uh, going to an office every day? Are you pursuing business? Are you pursuing new clients? Are you, you're creative. So are you creating product and trying to sell it? Are you going to trade shows or, you know, or uh, craft shows, are you doing the things that you would normally do in a business and you just don't happen to make profit that, you know, couple of years when you're starting out, then you're probably okay. Where you're consistently losing profit for the first 10 years, that you're at risk of being reclassified as a hobby and then the IRS disallowing those losses. So what some people do, especially if they have, you know, musicians, they, um, you know, I, there was a musician supported by his wife who did really well. <laughs> so for him, he didn't really claim all his expenses because it was a little bit of a risk for audit when they're filing returns. So some people don't claim all their expenses. I'm not a really big advocate of that. I'm thinking if you run your business like a business and you can document that and support that, I think you're fine with claiming the expenses. Just know that if it's for several years in a row, you may get a letter <laughs> asking for explanations and things like that. So be a little bit careful. Okay. You know yeah, what I mean? I've been recording everything, all my expenses, I've been mm -hmm. recording everything. Um, mm -hmm. And actually I was gonna ask you the software that I was, is, I'm was i using is Wave. And I didn't know if anyone had heard of it. Oh or yes, I have somebody who showed me that one recently. I was not in love with it from an accounting standpoint. It's it's an NG for us because it's just not accountant friendly. It's great for the user like yourself because it, it speaks your language. It doesn't speak accounting, so it doesn't translate. Okay. So it's like FreshBooks. I have a client, a creative. He uses FreshBooks because it speaks to him. It, 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 he can get through it. He understands what he's supposed to do, where he goes to bill his customers. Like he does all of that. I hate it when I get in yeah. there because I have to wade through the nightmare to yeah, find his I, actual I think, numbers. I think for but, me, you know, it, if it works for you. It, I, I think for me, it was, you know, a free program that like could introduce me to the accounting because I have no idea, yeah. you know, and yeah. I didn't feel like spending 25 bucks or whatever for QuickBooks every month. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to get a taste, but I was curious as to like, if that's not such a great thing to... Well, no, for you, if you're, if you're going to go up, if you're tracking your information and you're using it and then go for it, use it because you are actually doing what you should be doing. A lot of people, I mean, I'm sure Lisa has the same issue. I mean, they don't do any tracking. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they basically try to stuff it all in a shoebox at year end and be like, here, can you make something <laughs> out of this? You know, you at least have that. Yes. The accountant is not going to like it, but if it works for you, and you're religiously using it and you're keeping track of your information, your dollars in and your dollars out, keep using it. Keep using it. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Accounts, we can figure out stuff. Yeah, we'll <laughs> wade through the, we, we wade through the nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dan, you're on 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, here, sorry, I, I, I had a sneezing fit. <laughs> God bless you. Uh, um, in relation to the quarterlies, um, one thing that um, that um, we do uh, is um, we use the safe harbor, the um, hundred percent of last year, and maybe you could explain that a little bit to um, to some of these people. Uh, sure. Uh, so the safe harbor is as long as your income isn't. Hi, uh, which most of us aren't, right? So um, you have to pay in 100% of last year's tax. So what that means is as long as you do that, you do have a safe harbor for um, the interest um, on late payment of, of income, uh, income tax. However, the other thing, the thing to be careful of is if you're growing quickly, um, you might have a large tax bill if you haven't paid in your quarterlies. So that, that's sort of the, the, the other side of it is if all of a sudden your income goes up, remember that you're adding 15% of self-employment income in most cases on top. So it can grow pretty quickly, even, even for like 10 grand of income, it can be like, whoa, I owe four grand, wait, what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I don't like to have those conversations too late. Um, that's the only thing to consider. But yes, if you pay in 100%, I believe it's over 90% of the current year, um, then then you you fall under the safe harbor rules, which means that you don't have um, additional interest. The caveat to that is you have to pay your estimates ratably. Uh, so what some people will do is they'll have a really good year and they'll come see me in September and uh, look at it and say, oh, well, wait a minute, you should really pay in like, well, you should have paid in, you know, a thousand for the first quarter, a thousand for the second quarter. Um, so I'll have you pay in three grand now to catch you up. Um, the IRS doesn't like that. Uh, if you have a day job, W-2 um, taxes, the, the federal in, the federal withholding on your W-2 is considered paid in ratably, ratably no, regardless. So some people, if they have a day job, I'll tell them to increase their withholdings on their W-2 if they can do that, because then they don't get charged the interest for paying late on their estimates. So there is that piece as well. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, Michelle. <laughs> Big fat no. <laughs> the, only, the only thing that you could possibly count would be a franchise tax. Um, if you paid it, if you were incorporated um, and paid a franchise tax to a state, that might be deductible. That would be deductible on a federal, but um, but not on the state. <laughs> but um, and and if you pay annual report fees, so if you're an LLC and you have that five hundred dollar annual report fee, that would be deductible. That's it. <laughs> no, not the regular taxes. <laughs> oh, payroll taxes. Those are a deductible. Yeah, that is. <laughs> okay, well, we, well, we've got about 15 minutes left, so we can continue asking questions, but I'm going to launch the poll for you all. You'll be able to see it on your screen and respond to the poll, and we'd appreciate it if you would do that while it's in you. Um, should not be uh, in your way. You'll certainly be able to hear. Okay, great. It's out. So feel free to <laughs> fill that in as you see those questions. They help us a lot. Okay, do we have other questions out there in the, uh, in the group? Oh, did I hit something? I think I hit something. I was trying to close it. I might shut your pull off, I apologize. Oh. Let me just, sorry. Oops. Yep, I touched something. I was trying to I'm gonna relaunch get it, it off. <laughs> I'm gonna relaunch it. Sorry guys. <laughs> Let's try that again. Let me just put it on another monitor. <laughs> yeah, or just push it to the side. You can, scroll it. You can push yeah, it right off Yeah, just push it onto one of the other monitors. We're good. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so please do um, fill those questions in whilst uh, we continue to talk. I have another question for Dolly that came up while um, uh -huh. this is from me. Um, you had um, a bunch of software and those, that stuff is gonna be out there on, um, on the workshop resources as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if um, any of those were free. I know some people are really looking for free software. Dolly? Sorry about that. Um, I'm not entirely 
really sure if they're free. I can uh, find out and let you guys know. Okay. Yeah, maybe we can add it to the to uh, the slide. Mm -hmm. Reproduce the slide afterwards. Lori, is Wave free? Yes, it is. It is free, and they have add-ons that you can, you know, get additional products. But I mean, even like QuickBooks, I think it's a trial period. So most of them have trial periods that you can explore them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she's right. Most of them you will get it, if there'll be the free version, which will be a very muted version, and then you want more functionality, and that's probably with like Wave, you probably have to pay a little bit more, but yeah, if you want to get rolling on something. Yeah, you can yeah. even set it up so they can pay you through Wave, like they have the basically subcontractor or whatever um, oh, okay. companies, the third party companies that they work with to be able to allow you to have many of the things that QuickBooks does. There you go. Wave, W-A-V-E? Mm -hmm. Yes, W-A-V-E, yep. W -A -V -E. yep. Another one that um, that I've used before is called New Cash, N U C A S H, um, which is um, also free. Um, it's um, open source, so it continues to evolve, uh, mm. but it also runs on Macs and PCs um, and Linux machines. Um, it does not run in the cloud, so you have to you have mm. to use it local to yourself. But you can run it on any any device that you. I mean any computer that you use. And QuickBooks is into instituting, you used to be able to buy desktop for like 250. And now they're, um, they're saying anything for, I think it's 2022 and up is, um, it's going to be subscription based, kind of like QuickBooks online. Um, the thing is, you can drop a QuickBooks advi a pro advisor's name, like, um, I don't know about Dolly, I, you'd have to ask her, but you could certainly use my name. Um, you don't even have to use me. <laughs> you could just <laughs> use my name to get a um, like a longer trial period, like Lisa mentioned. Um, I would be fine with that. It doesn't matter. Um, but when you sign up, you call into it and you try to get a like a a deal because it can get expensive. Yeah, a larger business, you're definitely spending a couple bucks for sure. Mm. That's why we like Excel. <laughs> it's really cheap. Everybody has it, and most people know how to use it. Right. It's a nice, Hollis's, nice Hollis's template is also up on the website, so mm -hmm. you can download the template from the website <laughs> um, and uh, start there as a model. Definitely. That's a good place to start. If you've never mm -hmm. done anything like that whatsoever, yeah, very much so. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have another question from Barbara Healy. You're muted, Barbara. Hi. So my question is, you were talking about how the IRS wants you to be profitable um, over a course over of years. Course. Does a small profit count? Like, for I said, for example, if I made 5000 and I had 4500 expenses, so my total profit is 500 is that considered a profitable year that I'm not a hobby person? <laughs> I have never actually heard a threshold dollar. So oh, I, yeah. you know, right. So <laughs> yeah, I, I think small profit is okay. okay. It's not livable, but. <laughs> yeah. So once you get up, so once you get to a place <laughs> where you're never profitable in this business, according to the paper, and then you've got a mortgage and you've got mortgage interest, you're deducting on that tax return and you're paying a $2,000 a month mortgage, they're wondering, hmm, where are you getting that money from? So there's a reasonableness test that... Well, but like for someone like myself, I'm retired. I have a retirement income. Okay. I have, I have a pension. From so my, mm -hmm. my Schedule C is um, an extra income, so I do report it, but I don't make a, a large amount. Right. But yeah, as yeah. long as I'm I'm making money and not losing money every year, I should be okay. Pretty much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. On a very high yep. level. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> Karen is asking if you guys, um, if any of the bookkeepers or et cetera, know anything about um, Wix and its accounting capabilities. Um, it's a website builder, but apparently it has some accounting capabilities. Yeah, I'm not, I didn't realize that was something they, they did. Um, no, I'm not to me, I thought of it all as just a web, like a yeah. website builder. Um, I, I think mean that they don't, but yeah, I think it's probably more know. along the lines of Square and and um and its website builder or you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. So basically, you are the one getting the 1099 at year end for any income you had come through that website. Not you give the 1099 to people you that did work for you. Okay, has everybody had a chance to fill out the poll that plans to? So I'm going <laughs> to run out of time in a couple, of, very shortly. So please um, hit it now. Ah, okay. Uh, there's also been some software links posted in the um, <clears throat> in the chat for um, uh, Wave apps and. Um, Apparently, there's another new cache without the G, uh, <laughs> and the new cache with the G. Um, oh. And uh, I don't know what the one without the G is. Um, and somebody just posted um, fresh book information. Dolly posted fresh book mm -hmm. information as well. Um, and QuickBooks has been posted. So feel free to snag those before we uh, close out. Do we have other, other questions out there? All right, I think we're winding up then. about seven minutes early. I don't think that's too bad. <laughs> um, okay, we're getting a bunch of thank yous over there. Um, I'm going to close the poll. I wanted to thank all of our uh, attendees for great questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming out tonight, too. Okay, great. <clears throat> well, I want to thank our presenters. They've done a wonderful job. Um, thank you all for your uh, good questions. Um, we hope that you will, um, <clears throat> will follow Practice Best Practice on Facebook, Instagram, and sign up for our, um, our email. Um, and we will be doing more. We have um, ones coming up uh, in the spring, funding pending, uh, <laughs> that will <laughs> include um, things about um, running art auctions for nonprofits or places that want to raise money. Uh, one about um, showing art in your business on its walls. Um, one about um, pricing and, um, and marketing. Um, so we have some other, we have a whole list, but those are the ones that are <clears throat> at the moment top of the list. So stay tuned and see what, we're com what we bring up. Um, we'll have, hopefully we'll continue to run um, these. We're trying to target our budget so we can do six a year. Um, but um, we'll see how that goes uh, at the moment. Um, <clears throat> this is this is the end of our our fiscal year ends at the end of December, and uh, this ends our our funding so far <laughs> for this year. Um, but we keep uh, we keep working on writing grants, and uh, we will continue to raise money and go from there. So thank you all again, um, and we'll see you all next time.